رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد Today we will talk about hadith It's a Sahih al-Bukhari which is it's authentic hadith but it's not a hadith as we define the hadith because the hadith is whether the saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or one of the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on one of the taqreer the actions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accept or agreed to so this is just a story it's a story narrated or reported by Ibn Abbas about one incident happened with the king of Rome at the time of the Prophet and it's all happened between two both of them non-Muslims so it's in Sahih al-Bukhari but it's a story it's not a hadith but Ibn Rajab one of the scholars he said if you think it's just a story that mentioned in the book you are you are totally wrong because the Bukhari he put it in the in the chapter of Iman and the revelation of, of Wahi he, does, he doesn't put this for no reason there is a good reason to mention this story in the book of Ahadith and in the book of the starting of Revelation because this story tells you all the characters of the Prophet the last Prophet and it's all applied to the Prophet Sallallahu so first of all this Hadith reported by Ibn Abbas and we all know Ibn Abbas he's the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he's the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was born before Hijrah three years before Hijrah when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on the Shi'b the Shi'b, Shi'b Abi Talib when the boycott when they, they, they gather all the Muslims and they ask no one to sell or buy anything from them. It was very hard years when they put all the Muslims in a one valley and they surrounded them, no one buying or selling anything from them. Hardly they survived during this violence. So Ibn Abbas was born at that at that year and he uh, come with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Al-Madina he become with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make a lot of dua to Ibn Abbas he asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala أَيُّ التأويل, to give him the ability to explain and interpret the Quran and that's why they, they call all the Mufassirin, all the Mufassirin, they end with their tafsir to Ibn Abbas. He was so good by making tafsir to the Quran and he was a very good scholar as well. We said he's one of the Abadila, the, the four Abdullah scholars in Medina. And he has a really good wisdom, especially with discussions with others, Muslims or non-Muslims. And even with, with the big fitna, when the fitna happens between uh, Ali bin Abi Talib and Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an, he was the one who stopped almost 20,000 people from going in the wrong direction. Because when the tahkim happened, when Ali bin Abi Talib and Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan both they agreed to have some people to make a judgment between them who's right and who's wrong so the people at that time they split to three groups one with Muawiyah 
one with Ali bin Abi Talib, and one group they go so far, we call them Al Khawarij. They said both wrong. And they were around 25, 24 people, so they are quite like a good in number. So they try to fight both. So Ali bin Abi Talib sent Ibn Abbas to discuss with them why, why they do this. So they said, we did this for three reasons. <coughs> First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in al hukmu illa lillah. The judgment is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only to Allah. And Ali bin Abi Talib, he sent people to have hukum. And now he doesn't say, he doesn't follow the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't agree about this counsel that Ali bin Abi Talib accept to judge between him and Muawiyah. This is the first thing. Second thing, they said Ali bin Abi Talib, he fight the other group, but he doesn't take Sabi or Ghanan. He doesn't take the money from them and he doesn't killing them and he doesn't take their women as Jawari. What is Jawari? Slaves. Yes. So they said if they are Muslims, he's not allowed to fight them. And if they are not, why he didn't take their money? This is the second thing. The third thing, they said, Ali bin Abi Talib removed Amir al-Mu'mineen from the agreement. And when they have the agreement, Ali bin Abi Talib was the Amir of the Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers. But the other group, they don't admit that he's Amir al-Mu'mineen. So they asked him to remove it. And that's what he did. He removed Amir al-Mu'mineen. So they said, if he's not Amir al-Mu'mineen, then he's Amir al-Kuffar. He's the leader of Kuffar. It's very wrong, but that's what they said. And they are very big in numbers. They can fight both armies because themselves like 25 fighters, like it's, it's a big army. So then Ibn Abbas went to them and he asked them from the beginning. He said, do you want the right? If I bring a proof from Quran and Sunnah, do you follow it or you just want to fight? They said, no we will go to the proof and we will apply to it if, if you really give us a proof from Quran and Sunnah. He said, so only these three what, what you have against Ali bin Abi Talib? They said, yes. He said, okay, so the first one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in his book about killing the sight hunting in Haram. He said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la taqtulu al-sayda wa antum, hurum. Wa man qatalahu minkum, muta'amidan, fajazau, fajazau, mithlu ma qatala, minan na'am. Yahkum ubihi, dhawa adlim minkum. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the hukum is for two trustful people from you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala agreed to have some judgment from trustful people. So which one is more important? The bloods between two armies, both Muslims, or to killing a rabbit in Haram? And then he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said about the husband and wife, فَبْعَثُوا بِحَكَمٍ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا وَحَكَمٍ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again He asks you to have some 
judge from you. So they said, this is the first one. And they agreed to it. The second thing, they said that Ali bin Abi Talib doesn't take the sabi, doesn't take the money. And this is right. Ali bin Abi Talib at the beginning with, with the war with the Muslims, he doesn't even take the right, doesn't even ask his leader to fight until they fight him. He said no one fight because they are Muslims. He afraid. Until they fight him and they, they, they actually kill the one guy from his army and they said, oh Allah be my witness, I didn't start this. He was so pious, Ali bin Abi Talib, rahmatullah. So, Ibn Abbas said, Ali bin Abi Talib, at the beginning he fight in the camel fight. And it's against the army they have with them Aisha, Umm al -Mu'mineen. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Aisha, it's one of the mothers of the believers. He said, do you accept to have your mother as a slave? To take her as a sabi? Is that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you to do? And then they agree with this point again. And about the third one, he said, the other army, the army of Muawiyah, they didn't accept Ali bin Abi Talib as a leader of believers, as Amir al muminin And that doesn't make him something else. Just like the Prophet Sallallahu in Sulh al hudaybi when he tried to discuss with the kuffar and tried to, to write the, the contract, he said, this is the contract between Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they said, if we believe that you are Rasulullah, we have no issue with you. But we don't believe you are Rasulullah. You are the Prophet that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has sent. So they asked him to remove it. And Ali bin Abi Talib, he was writing the contract. And he asked Ali bin Abi Talib to remove it. But he said, I will not ever remove Rasulullah from the contract. So the Prophet Sallallahu said to Ali, show me where is it? And he removed it himself. He said, that doesn't make the Prophet Sallallahu something else. He's still the Prophet of Allah. But he removed it before he had the contract done because the other group, they didn't, they didn't admit that he is the Prophet of Allah. So 20,000 from this army joined Ali again. And they said around 4,000, they stay as Khawarj. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved a lot of Muslims from a bad path because the wisdom of Ibn Abbas. He was really good scholar and he established a lot of fiqh in al Badin. And even Umar bin al-Khattab, he used, even though he was a young, he used to call him and let him sit with the, with the elders. And he used to ask him. Even sometimes like people ask about one ayah or one surah. And then he turned to Ibn Abbas and asked, even though they all older than him. And he was so respectful for the others. He, even if he asked, he, he would say, I didn't say anything unless I hear from you. Because he was <coughs> young. And even when he see the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu he used to take, uh, to lead their uh, horses, for example. And he said, that's how our Prophet taught us to respect our elders. Even though he's the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu and they used to have respect for him. He's a scholar, he's a knowledgeable, he's, he has a wisdom, they all know the Prophet Sallallahu make dua for him. And 
when he when he speaks that's why Umar ibn al-Khattab he said he speaks very well and he has the knowledge and it's very hard to find these kinds of people there is a lot of people they have a knowledge but they can't really express themselves very well and I know subhanallah there is a lot of mashayikh they have really good knowledge when they teach student but if they give a lecture they will start like they can't really deliver the information so subhanallah ibn Abbas he was so good and he narrated a lot of reported a lot of hadith so we start with this hadith which is it's a story happens to Abu Sufyan before he become a Muslim with the king of Rome and Ibn Abbas he asked him about this story and he reported in Sahih al-Bukhari so if you start inshallah because we will read it in English yes yes I'll just read the English because we don't have the Arabic uh, narrated Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an uh, and Abu Sufyan ibn Hab informed me that Heraclius had sent a messenger to him while he had been accompanying a caravan from Quraysh okay so one minute here so first of all this is as I said it happens to Abu Sufyan and Abu Sufyan he was born before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, almost 10 years before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he uh, became Muslim on Fath Mecca. Some of the, the scholars even they said even later. Or he became Muslim and then he became a true Muslim in, in, in somewhere else. But he became Muslim on Fath Mecca. And this incident happened after Sulh al hudaybiyah when they have the agreement with the mushrikeen so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time wasn't uh, he before come, comes to Mecca and occupied Mecca so this is happens within the Sulh of al hudaybiyah so this is before Abu Sufyan become a Muslim and uh, Hiraql or Hirqil in, in another narration it's the name of the king of Rome it's the name of the king of Rome and he was a scholar in Christianity he was a scholar in Christianity and he used to live somewhere near to Hems which is in it's all in, in Sham and uh, at that time when this incident happened he was in Beit al-Maqdis he wasn't in, in his city he was in Beit al-Maqdis what happened that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a book to all the leaders at that time and when he got this we call it kitab which is a message from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he want because he was a scholar in his Christianity and he knows that there is a prophet will will come and it's time for a prophet so he asks some of his uh, which is the the lowest level of scholars or uh, servants to bring some people knows that prophet so when he sent them they found Abu Sufyan and almost 20 to 30 people from Mecca which is they know the Prophet Sallallahu they make a trade in, in Sham so they ask him to come they were merchants doing business in Sham at the time when Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had truce with Abu Sufyan and Quraysh infidels the and contract period like between them and again Sham or Sham it's both it's the land from Al-Arish to Al-Furat from Al-Arish to Al-Furat it's all Sham it's all Sham and they it's Ardul Mahshar 
It's like the, the hashr will be in, the, in this dunya will be there. This is in Sahih Muslim, by the way. So Abu Sufyan and his companions went to Heraclius at Ilya. Ilya, which is Beitul Maqdis. They called Ilya, Ilya, Ilya. Heraclius called them in the court, <coughs> and he had all the senior Roman dignitaries around him. And you know, Ilya, when we call this Beitul Maqdis, the Salat there, it's equal to how many Salat in Beitul Maqdis? So we have three masajid, right? لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد. That's the edger is multiplied more than the other masajid. All the masajid are equal except three. Masjid al-Haram, one hundred thousand. And Medina, Masjid al-Nabawi, one thousand. And five hundred. Five Actually, there is. A lot of hadiths describe the edger. Some of them they said 500. Some of them they said 1,000. Some of them they said uh, 250. But the most uh, authentic one or the scholars they said it's 500. He called for, so Heraclius called them in the court and he had all the senior Roman dignitaries around him. He called for his translator who who, translating Heraclius' question, said to them, Who amongst you is closely related to the man who claims to be a prophet? Okay, so why, why, why Heraclius asked these people about the Prophet Wasallam? Why he asked to bring them? Because he knows there is a prophet who will come. So he wants to know if it's true. He is the last prophet that he read about in his books or not. That's what he wants to confirm. He knows there's a prophet will come. And he just wants to confirm if it's the Prophet وسلم, is the same or not. Abu Sufyan replied, I am the nearest relative to him amongst the group. Heraclius said, bring him Abu Sufyan close to me and make his companions stand near behind him. You will see, you will see Heracl was a scholar and he knows what he's asking for. That's why he said, bring him close to me and put his companion very close at his back. You know why? Because he will ask them if he lied to point his lying. If he said anything wrong about the Prophet ﷺ, because he knows these people are the enemy of the Prophet. Are the enemy of the Prophet ﷺ. So they may lie on him. That's the scholar they said, it's a one, one fa'idah from this hadith, one benefit, that you shouldn't ask the enemy to be a witness on his enemy. <laughs> You can't because he would lie. But Herqal, even though that he knows he would lie, he made this trick to stop him from lying. Because he knows that the honorable guy, he wouldn't lie in front of his group. Because when he will go back, they will say, oh, this is the liar who lied, even though he did it for their good. That's why Abu Sufyan, he would say, he would say, uh, if I wouldn't scared, they will uh, call me a liar, I would easily lie to, to Qaisar. And by the way, Qaisar is his title. It's the same guy, his name is Herqal, and his title is Qaisar. Bring Abu Sufyan close to me and make his companion stand near behind him. Abu Sufyan further added, Heraclius told his translator to tell my companions that he wanted to put some questions to me regarding that man, the Prophet wasallam, and that if I told a lie, they, my companions, should contradict me. 
Abu Sufyan added, by Allah, had I not been ashamed of my companions labeling me a liar, I would not have spoken the truth about the Prophet ﷺ. The first question he asked me about was, what is his family status amongst you? I replied, he belongs to a good, noble family amongst us. Yes, because why the first question he asked is, Salam. because he knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't choose someone to be a prophet without being a pure. That's why Allah the Prophet وسلم, said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen the Arab and choosing Quraysh from Arab and choosing Bani Hashim from Quraysh and choose me from <laughs> Bani Hashim. So I'm the chosen one. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picked him from the good and the better, the better, the better. Heraclius further asked, has anybody, has anybody else amongst you ever claimed the same, i.e. to be a prophet before his claim? I replied, no. Because he just want to check if he just repeating what the others say. But actually, and this is known that Jewish, like many Israel, generally, they have the prophethood. The prophet is in their lineage. But Arab, there is no other prophet. Only the Prophet wasallam. From Ismail, there is no other prophet to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. That's why no one expects that the prophet will come from these people. No one even think about that. Even the, the scholars of Bani Israel, even Herakl himself, he doesn't think. He thought it will come from Bani Israel. That's why he asked. He thought, he thought like maybe some people, they think about it and they claim that they are prophets, but no one claimed. And that's a proof that it's not in their mentality that no one they know there is no prophets from them so no one claimed that he's a prophet but after the prophet وسلم, many people claimed that they are a prophet because now it's it's there that's why he asking and this is very clever question Heraclius asked was anybody amongst his ancestors a king i replied no Heraclius asked do the so why, why he said a king again because if there is a king in his lineage maybe he's a claim that he's a king and he won the kingdom of his father but there is nothing Heraclius asked do the nobles or the poor follow him do the nobles or the poor follow him I replied it is the poor who follow him he said, are his followers increasing or decreasing day by day? I replied, they are increasing. He then asked, does anybody amongst those who embrace his religion become displeased and renounce the religion afterwards? I replied, no. Okay. So now he's asking about the companions of the Prophet Usually, if, if someone just seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will find not really the noble people and the rich people would accept him they they seeking this dunya the noble the rich people or the poor the weak people and he confirmed only the weak people and usually the leaders of Quraysh they, they fight they fighting him Till that time. And again he asked him, anyone returned to you from his religion? And he said, Sakhtatan. That means he doesn't please, doesn't pleased with the religion. Not about something of this dunya, because there are some people, they, for a reason, as a, as a one in Habasha, when he wants to marry a, a lady, he, he left Islam. One of 
he, he used to be among the Sahaba and, and, and he died as non-Muslim. That's why he asked him. He found some error in Islam and he left it. Not because a reason of this dunya. Because there are some people, they leave Islam for a reason. And you will find in the end of the story, there are some people, they think Islam is right, but they don't follow it for a reason of this dunya because there is a lot of temptation that they can't really reach with, with the Islam. So there is a guy, he, he loved a Christian, a Christian uh, woman and then he became a Christian and left Islam. Not because he doesn't li like Islam, but because he wants this lady. Have you ever accused him of telling lies before his claims to be a prophet? I replied, no. Heraclius said, does he ever betray or prove treacherous to his covenants? I replied, no. We are at truce with him, but we do not know what he will do in it. Okay. Now, Abu Sufyan, he said, I couldn't lie because his people. But he wanted to say something bad about the Prophet. So when the Caesar asked him, is the Prophet وسلم, is a traitor, he, he betrayed his people. He said, no, but we have a contract with him and it's going, we don't know, maybe he will do it. So he just want like to insult him. He said like, maybe he will do it soon, we don't know. So he just want to point that he really hate him. Heraclius asked, have you ever had a war with him? I replied, yes. Then he said, what was the outcome of the battles? I replied, sometimes he was victorious and sometimes we. Why he said this? Because this is after Uhud. So the Prophet ﷺ won the war of Badr. And the Mushrikeen won the war of Uhud. Heraclius said, what does he order you to do? I said, he tells us to worship Allah alone and not to worship anything along with him and to renounce all that our ancestors had said. He orders us to pray, to speak the truth, to be chaste, and to keep good relations with our kith and kin. Heraclius asked the translator to convey to me the following. I asked you about his family, and your reply was that he belonged to a very noble family. In fact, all the messengers come from noble families amongst their respective peoples. I questioned you whether anybody else amongst you claimed such a thing. Your reply was in the negative. If the answer had been in the affirmative, I would have thought that this man was following the previous man's statement. Then I asked you whether any one of his ancestors was a king. Your reply was in the negative, and if it had been in the affirmative, I would have thought that this man wanted to take back his ancestral kingdom. I further asked whether he was ever accused of telling lies before he said what he said, and your reply was in the negative. So I wondered how a person who does not tell a lie about others could ever tell a lie about Allah. I then asked you whether the rich people followed him or the poor. You replied that it was the poor who followed him, and in fact, these poor always are the followers of the messengers. Then I asked you whether his followers were increasing or decreasing. You replied that they were increasing, and in fact, this is the way of true faith, till it is complete in all respects. I further asked you whether there was anybody who, after embracing his religion, became displeased and discarded his religion, your reply was in the negative. And in fact, this is the sign of true faith. And when its delight enters the hearts and mixes with them completely, I asked you whether he had ever betrayed. I asked you whether he had ever betrayed. You replied in the negative, and likewise, the messengers never betray. Then I asked you what he ordered you to do. You replied that he ordered you to worship Allah and Allah alone and not to worship anything along with him, and forbade you to worship idols, and ordered you to pray, to speak the truth, and to be chaste. If what you have said is true, he will very soon occupy the Now, place. pay attention to what Herqal would say. 
he would say very good things about the Prophet Sallallahu Only the believers would say it. Would say it. So just focus on what he going to say. If what you have said is true, he will very soon occupy this place which is underneath my feet now. And I knew it from the scriptures that he was going to appear, but I did not know that he would be from you. And if I am sure to reach him, I would go immediately to meet him. And if I were with him, I would certainly wash his feet. Heraclius then asked for the letter addressed by Allah's Messenger Sallallahu yes. Alaihi Wasallam. Then he brought the, the letter that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has sent to him and he would read it. Before he start reading it, I want to point here that he said, I would go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and wash his feet. So this tells us that he accepted the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it's not. He accepts and he knows that he is the prophet. And he said, if it's I in your position, I would do this. But let's see if he did it or not. Heraclius then asked for the letter addressed by Allah's Messenger وسلم, which was delivered by Dihya to the governor yes, of Yes, Dihya al-Kalbi or Dihya al-Kalbi who forwarded it to Heraclius to read. Actually, this when this is another hadith that the Prophet وسلم, this is, again, this is the king of Rome. It was an empire. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with some people in, in, in Al Madinah. At that time, he couldn't even defeat the Mushrikeen from Quraysh. And they used to attack him. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to send a letter to a king of empire. You will see how he talked to him first and then when he want to send it people get scared who's gonna deliver this message to the king that the people that that the Arab they used to go there and make sujood to him they really bow to, to him so the Prophet وسلم, said who's taking this book or this letter and give it to this king and he will enter Jannah. So one of the Ansar, his name, Dihya al-Kalbi. And he was very good looking guy. They said even Jibreel, he used to come on his shape when he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the form of man. He said, O oh Rasulullah, that if if this king become Muslim or just send him the letter. He said, no, anyone deliver this letter, he will enter Jannah. So he said, I will do it. And he was absolutely sure he will get killed. But he said, Alhamdulillah. So let's continue. The contents of the letter was, were as follows. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to start Bismika Allahu, just like before. And then when it becomes Bismillahi Majraha, uh, he start Bismillah and then he add Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim when it comes Wa innahu min Sulaiman wa innahu Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim when it revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, this letter is from Muhammad, the slave of Allah and his messenger. He, he starts with the slave of Allah and his messenger. The slave of Allah before messenger. Just to make it clear, he is the slave of Allah. To Heraclius, the ruler of, Byzant of, of Byzantines, peace be upon him, who, sorry, from Muhammad, the slave of Allah and his messenger to Heraclius, the ruler of Byzantines, peace be upon him who follows the right path. Again, he doesn't say Assalamu alaikum. He said Assalamu ala man ittaba al huda. 
again he said assalamu ala man ittaba'a al-huda salam to whom who follow the right or the guidance <coughs> because he doesn't know if he's going to be muslim or not if he's going to fight or not salamu alaykum that's been peace be upon you nothing can happen between us that's why you can't start with someone say salamu alaykum and then you betray him or you do something wrong or you talk about him you say salamu alaykum you should keep it you start with the peace you have to keep it to the end peace be upon him who follows the right path then after I invite you to Islam and if you become a Muslim you will be safe and Allah will double your reward why he said will double your reward because he believe in Jesus and then if he believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he will get double rewards as a Christian as a true Christian and as Muslim and if you reject this invitation of Islam you will be committing a sin by misguiding your Harisin Harisin peasants Harisin Harisin which is you know these people they follow the true Christianity they don't believe in, in the three they don't believe in Jesus as a God they believe Jesus as a prophet so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned them because they are the true Christian he said you will get the sin of these people and I recite to you Allah's statement O people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, come to a word that is just between us and you, that we worship none but Allah Ta'ala, and that we associate no partners with Him, and that none of us shall take others as lords beside Allah. Then, if they turn away, say, bear witness that we are Muslims. So this is the letter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the king or to the leader of Rome and it's simple and direct Aslim, Taslim become Muslim you will be saved and if he become Muslim he will be saved in this dunya and akhirah but unfortunately he doesn't follow this letter that's why the scholars at the end they said if he he gets scared from his people and he doesn't follow Islam they said if he really followed the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Aslim Taslim he will be saved he will be saved in this dunya and hereafter Abu Sufyan then added when Heraclius had finished his speech and had read the letter there was a great hue and cry in the royal court so we were turned out of the court. I told my companions that the question of Ibn Abi Kabsha. Ibn Abi Kabsha was the Prophet Sallallahu I will tell you this is a story. Prophet so let, let's continue this until the end. I told my companions that the question of Ibn Abi Kabsha, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had become so prominent that even the king of Bani Asfar, Byzantines, is afraid of him. Thenceforth, I became sure that he, the Prophet وسلم, would be the conqueror in the near future till I embraced Islam. Allah Azza wa Jal guided me to it. So, Abu Sufyan said, at that time, because they don't know the language of, of the king, when the king said what he said, his people they start complaining because he said I will wash his feet and he said very good things about him he said like a lot of people wasn't like complain and there is so screaming and they ask the guards to take us out after this point we don't know what happened but Abu Sufyan told his people that the matter of Ibn Abi Kabsha which is the Prophet ﷺ, and he named him this to insult him Ibn Abi Kabsha, they said 
he is from Khuza'a. All people was used to worship some gods and he used to deny and worship something else. So he just like said, oh, this is, is co comparing to this one, it's just like the same. Or they said, it's this one, he was one of the uncles of the Prophet ﷺ from his mother's side. He's not like a direct prophet. And he wasn't really well known in his lineage. So he just want to insult the Prophet ﷺ, so, so he described him in this name. So he want to say something bad about the Prophet. That tells you like he was really hate the Prophet ﷺ, even though he said, at that time I realized that even this king, he afraid of the Prophet. And I, I realized he will be, he will be the, the Prophet and he will occupy all these lands by the right message. But he still mentioned a very bad name to the Prophet The sub-narrator, the sub-narrator. And there is one thing he said, Bani al-Asfar, the, the sons of yellow people about the room. And they, they this is how the, the, the Arab used to call the room, Bani al-Asfar, because their, their skin, the Arab, their skin, it's almost white to dark or two, even if it's white, it's a little bit uh, dark. But the other people, they are more yellow or white, whitish than the Arab. So they call them Banu al-Asfar. The sub-narrator adds, Ibn al-Natur was the governor of Ilya and Heraclius. Yes, Ibn al-Natur, he was the governor of He's the responsible for Ilya Bayt al Maqdis. I, I told you at this uh, at the beginning. So Hirqal was the king and he was a scholar and he was in his city near to Hims in Sham. But Ilya, the governor of Ilya, he was a very good scholar in Christianity. And he became Muslim. He he believed in the Prophet ﷺ and he was killed by her. That's what some other stories said. Because he believed in the Prophet. He knows that the Prophet ﷺ is, is the last Prophet. So he was a scholar equal equal to uh, Hirqal. So he asked him, he showed him the, the letter and he confirmed that he is the Prophet and he believed in him. But he was killed by Hirqal. And again, till now, the story from Abu Sufyan, it ends. Now, this edition is from Az Zuhri, one of the reporters of the hadith after Ibn Abbas. It's his story. Ibn al Natur narrate, narrates that once while Heraclius was visiting Ilya in Jerusalem, he got up in the morning with a sad mood. Some of his priests asked him why he was in that mood. Heraclius was a foreteller and an astrologer. He he replied, at night, when I looked at the stars, I saw that the leader of those who practiced circumcision had appeared, become the conqueror, and asked, who are they who practice circumcision? The people replied... Because the Christian at that time, they, they weren't practicing this. It's only Arab and Jewish. But they didn't know about the Arab. Who are they who practice circumcision? The people replied, except the Jews, nobody practices circumcision, so you should not be afraid of them, the Jews. Just issue orders to kill every Jew present in the country. While they were discussing it, a messenger sent by the king of Hassan to convey the news of Allah's messenger وسلم, to Heraclius was brought in. Having heard the news, he, Heraclius, ordered the people to go and see whether the messenger of Ghassan was circumcised. Because he wanted to be sure, like, so there is a guy brought the, uh, the news to Hirqali, to Hirqals, uh, about the Prophet Sallallahu And then he wants to be sure whether he is circumcised or not. So he asked his people to check. And they checked out them. The people, after, after seeing him, told Heraclius that he was circumcised. 
Heraclius then asked him about the Arabs. The messenger replied, Arabs also practice circumcision. After hearing that, Heraclius remarked that sovereignty of this nation, Arabs, had appeared. Heraclius then wrote a letter to his friend in Rome, who was as good as Heraclius in knowledge. Heraclius then left for Homs, a town in Syria, and stayed there till he received the reply of his letter from his friend, who agreed with him in his opinion about the emergence of the Prophet wasallam, and in fact, that he indeed is a prophet. On that, Heraclius invited all the heads of the Byzantines to assemble in his place at Hems. When they assembled, he ordered that all the doors of his palace be closed. Then he came out and said, O Byzantines, if success is your desire, and if you seek right guidance and want your empire to remain, then give the bay'ah pledge to this prophet وسلم, that is embrace Islam. Listen to their reply. On hearing the views of Heraclius, the people ran towards the gates of the palace like onagers, but found the doors closed. Heraclius re re realized their hatred towards Islam, and when he lost the hopes of their embracing Islam, he ordered, bring them back to me. When they returned, he said, what I already said was just to test the strength of your conviction, and I have seen it. The people post prostrated before him and became pleased with him, and this was the end of Heraclius' story in connection with his faith. Okay, so now, we said Heracl, he knows for sure that the Prophet ﷺ was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he knows, he believed, but he thought like he has the kingdom and the whole empire of Byzantine. So now, he doesn't want to give up all this to become a Muslim. And the scholar, they said, if he become a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even will save him. In this life, he will become the king of Byzantine. And he will become saved in the hereafter. Because the Prophet sallallahu said, Aslim, Teslim, you will be protected. It's a promise from the Prophet wasallam that if he become Muslim, he will be protected. But because he's not a Muslim, he's still connected to this dunya. He's still connected to his empire. The rule, the dunya is inside his heart. So he gathered all people in his castle. All the leaders of Byzantine. And he asked the guards to close the doors. Put them in one room. And he said, if you want me, I will show you the success and the good path. He said, believe in the Prophet and give him the pledge. And then he said, they run away just like the zebras. And they went to the doors and they found all doors are closed. So he looked to them and he said, there is no way that they will believe in the Prophet. And if I believe alone, I will lose my kingdom. So what to do? Bring them back. He said, I just want to test your Iman. And when he said this, they, make, they made sujood for him. And he said, okay, we will fight the Prophet. So even though he knows the Prophet wasallam was right, he said, I want my kingdom. My kingdom. I want this empire. And he fight the Prophet wasallam. And they said, this is the end of this king. So easily he can achieve success in, in, in this life and hereafter and he knows but he denied so subhanallah sometimes it's, it's 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 not about you know or not it's to have the ability to believe to have success from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hidayah 
guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to follow the right. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu you don't give guidance to whom you want. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give guidance to whom he wants. Even the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu the one who protect the Prophet, protect the message of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him a reason to separate Islam because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi they want to kill them. To kill the Prophet sallallahu and then he protect him. He said, "No one can touch the Prophet." And without this protection, he couldn't deliver da'wah. So again, what he said to the Prophet, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa taala doesn't give him success to be a believer. He said, "If I, if I'm not afraid that the people of Quraysh after me they would say I left my." Father, religion, I would say it for you. Not for the sake of Allah. I would say it for you because I like you. He loved the Prophet ﷺ. That's why he protected him. Not for the sake of Allah. So he didn't do all these things for the sake of Islam. Because he liked the Prophet ﷺ. He raised the Prophet ﷺ himself. He knows the Prophet ﷺ doesn't lie. He knows he's a prophet. He used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rain. Take the Prophet ﷺ to the Kaaba. When he took the Prophet ﷺ to Sham, one of the, the scholars of Christianity, they said, keep him safe, he's the prophet. He knows that and he realizes it. And he hide the Prophet ﷺ from them and send it to Mecca. And he knows he is the Prophet. But to the end, he couldn't say La ilaha illallah. And it's the only thing that the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, this, it doesn't say like, oh, pray, don't drink, don't do this, don't do this. He said, say La ilaha illallah. Right. And alhamdulillah, we are pleased that we can say La ilaha illallah many times during the day. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us success to say it. And whoever, the last word, before he die, say, La ilaha illallah, he will enter Jannah, as the Prophet ﷺ said. But we should keep practicing, say, La ilaha illallah. It's the best dhikr, La ilaha illallah. The best dhikr to say, La ilaha illallah. Train your tongue to say, La ilaha illallah. You don't know, maybe it will be very difficult to you to say, La ilaha illallah, before you die. So again, because Abu Talib and Hirqan, they don't really, they know it's, it's right, but they don't really do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give them success to say la ilaha illallah. The guidance to say la ilaha illallah. So it's very important to purify your heart and to make ikhlas, sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give you the success to say la ilaha illallah and to die on Islam. Any questions? No? Okay, jazakumullah khair, barakallah people. I'm sorry the hadith is like so long, but it's worth to say. Is that